One of the first games I remember playing was, as a kid was the game Mousetrap. Do you guys ever remember playing that game? And, and the reason why I remember playing this, I think, I think one of the reasons why it was so embedded into my life is because it took an uncomfortably long amount of time for my parents to figure out how to put that whole thing together because there was a lot of different moving parts and contraptions and, and ways to see that done. But if you know Mousetrap, I don't think we've played it with our kids. But if you ever played Mousetrap, you know that there's kind of an intricate system of devices and traps that as you move your pieces around the board can be triggered to capture your mouse and ultimately get your cheese. So like the goal of the game, I know it sounds cruel and unusual, like it's, and kind of gross. Like who thought like, what's, who like, who looked at, look at a dead mouse in a trap and go, let's make a kid's board game out of this. Like it's a, what's that? And cheese? Chuck E. Cheese did that? Okay, well, who knows? So Chuck E. Cheese thought this through a game. But here's the whole point of the game is to trap other people's mice by all these elaborate little schemes and things. You know, guys start diving, cages start coming down, and capture their mice so that you can get all their cheese, and once you get all their cheese, you win the game. And so the whole point is to lay out traps to capture and stop your opponents. And as I've been thinking about Nehemiah 6 and reading through Nehemiah 6, Nehemiah 6 is kind of like a real-life game of, of a mousetrap. Because in Nehemiah chapter 6, all of the enemies of Nehemiah and Jerusalem are throwing everything they can get at Nehemiah to try to trap him, capture him and stop him from the work. It's like a, a movie plot line of, of schemes and twists and plotting. So it's a really cool chapter. But the truth is, this, this chapter is not just about Nehemiah. This, this in many ways can feel like your life and my life. Because as we seek our own rebuilding journey, as we seek our own desire to have God do a work in our lives, as we kind of set off on a direction for God, there are traps that you and I will face along life's journey. It can feel like everywhere we look, there are traps trying to pull us from God's mission, pull us from God's purposes, pull us from what God desires to have us done in our lives. Every commercial we watch on TV feels like it can be a trap trying to pull our, our money, our attention, our satisfaction, our desires. Like, if you have this, then you'll be happy. If you buy this, you'll be cooler than your neighbors. If you go to this, then things will be better. Every commercial and ad is kind of like a trap saying, I want your attention, I want your distraction, I want your money, I want your focus. Social media traps all over the place of designed to keep you scrolling and checking and wanting and desiring and seeing somebody's perfectly curated life so that way your not so curated life feels terrible. There's traps there. There's people that are traps in your life that don't press you toward Jesus, but further from Jesus, further toward the struggles you have, further toward unhealthy things, further toward directions you want to go. Ikea is a trap. You go to Ikea and six hours later, you've bought furniture and plants you don't need, but they, but they trap you in that store. So all of life, here's my point. The game of mousetrap may be a game, but all of life, there are distractions and traps meant to pull us away from the purposes that I believe God has for our lives. There are distractions in our focus. And of course, we're not just talking about living your best life. We're talking about the mission that God has for you and I, the purposes God has for you and I. And so here's how I would define like a trap. A traps come when someone else has an agenda and plan for your life that is outside of God's best plan. That's a trap, right? That's, that's, a, that's a shift in focus, a distraction, a trap. When, when somebody has something, that somebody may be you, Maybe you're even internally struggling with these things. Or someone else, a trap comes when there is something that pulls you from the purposes God has for you. And we see that here in Nehemiah 6, some, some four examples actually of different kinds of traps that I think will help us categorize the different kind of traps that you and I face in our lives today. Um, just to review what's happened so far in the book of Nehemiah, 
The book of Nehemiah started out with Nehemiah. He's a cupbearer to the king. He's serving the king. He's far from Jerusalem. But he gets word through his brother that things are not good back in Jerusalem, God's holy city, God's special city, the temple of God, the city where it rests. He finds out that things are not good. The walls are broken down and the city's in a shambles and the people are in shame. Nehemiah is burdened. He begins to pray and seek God and ask God for favor. And God answers his prayer. God gives him favor, both, both God's favor and favor with the king. And so the king gives Nehemiah favor to go with resources and permission to return back to Jerusalem and rebuild the destroyed city and kind of restore its walls, restore its people, and kind of short term do some work in that place. Nehemiah comes back. Things are going great. He personally inspects the damage. He casts vision for the people of Jerusalem. Here's, here's the problem. Here's what we're going to do about it. He rallies everybody together, and they begin this process of mobilization, and everyone's got a spot. They put the wall back together. Of course, there's, there's conflict along the way. We have Tobiah and Sambalat kind of driving the ship here. They they mock them, they threaten them to the point where now the wall is being built with a sword on one side and, and, and a hammer on the other side. And so there's been external threats and there's even been internal conflict. Last week we looked at how the, the rich were kind of abusing the poor and there were all these injustices and ultimately ways of breaking God's word that were happening inside the city. So Nehemiah has dealt with external conflict. He's dealt with internal conflict. He's dealt with resources. So Nehemiah's been moving forward. But chapter six is like the last ditch. Let's throw everything at Nehemiah to try to get him to slow down and stop. And so from our lives, I think that we learn the traps that we should avoid as you and I follow God's mission, I think we can see these traps in our lives, avoid them, and keep pursuing God's mission. Because when you seek out a purpose of God, a mission of God, the plan of God for your life, there will be works in progress to slow you down, stop you, and pull you from that mission. So just like Nehemiah, let's be aware of these traps. Let's respond, and by God's grace, let's press through temptations, distractions, traps, and all the rest. So let me pray, and then let's, let's look at the traps we want to avoid as we follow on the mission of God. So God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a chance to sing, to, to see one another, to celebrate you, to, to uh, and just anticipate your move. Lord, we pray for a revival in our community like we're seeing in Ashbury. We pray for a revival in our living rooms we pray for revival in our neighborhoods. We pray for revival in our church, not just to feel something better, but so that way we can really display the hope and seek the holiness that we can have through Jesus Christ. So God, um, as we seek after you, help us to see the dangers, the roadblocks, the barriers, the traps that are laid before us that can cause us to lose focus on the mission, that can cause us to lose focus on Jesus, that can cause us to fail in, in seeking you fully and living for you fully and serving you fully. So God, help us to walk through these traps with wisdom, with clarity, and with purpose that you have a plan for our lives, and that plan is better than anything else that's thrown at us. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this passage. Teach us through it, convict us through it, and change us through it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So what, what traps should we avoid Based on the story of Nehemiah, what are some traps that we should avoid as we ourselves chase after God's mission, God's plans, and God's purposes for our life? Here's the first trap I think we see in Nehemiah. We see the trap of missed priorities. Nehemiah came to Jerusalem to build a wall, to restore a people. That was his job number one. But he's tempted here. One of the traps that's thrown before him is to chase after secondary things, not the wall. And the same is true in your life. God has priorities for your life. And there's a constant battle or trap to chase after lesser priorities than God's priorities. And you'll see that here in verse uh, 1. Let's get into our passage. Verse 1 starts out. When Symbolit and Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there was no gap left in it, 
though at that time I had not installed the doors in the city gates, Sambalat and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. There they planned to harm me. So here's the scene. The wall is almost done. Like all they have to do is finish up the gates. But a wall without gates is still not a wall, right? There's still holes. There's still openings. It's still vulnerable. So, so it, we're like just inches from the finish line of this wall. And so Tobiah and Sambalat, who all along have hated this wall being built. Uh, Geshem as well, the Arab, who's not as much of a player here. But, but all these enemies, they've hated that Jerusalem is being restored. And so they've been throwing everything against them from verbal threats to physical threats. That's not worked at all. And so now in this last ditch effort, they try to get Nehemiah to leave the work to go have a meeting with them. And in many ways, this sounds, this sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? You have all these enemies who are, who are trying to make peace with you. Like that's, that's a noble thing. Like who, who wouldn't want to go and referee so that way you're not having to wear your sword around everywhere, so that way they're not throwing insults at you? Like that sounds like making peace with your neighbors sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? But the truth is they weren't, they weren't out for peace. They were trying to get Nehemiah to leave the wall so they could jump him and harm him and do whatever they needed to do to stop him from rebuilding the wall. And and here's what Nehemiah says. I love the way he answers this in verse 3. He says, So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing important work and cannot come down. Why Why should the work cease when I leave it and go down to you? And four times they sent me the same proposal and I gave them the same reply. See, Nehemiah, he doesn't go, yeah, right. He doesn't like question their motives. He doesn't go, yeah, right. You just want to kill me. He actually says no by pointing to his priorities. He says no to this peace invitation by pointing them to the real priority that he has. Why should I stop my important work to come meet with you? In other words, the priority I have is this wall, and I'm not going to let anything get in the way. I'm building a wall. You know, when, uh, when Pam and I were first married, and we, I can't remember if this was on, we had very limited cable choices, and we had this little tiny 18-inch um, tube TV that I had bought in, in college with, with my hard-earned, like, lifeguarding money, and that was all the money I had. And so we watched whatever the antenna would pick up, but we'd, we'd get, we got this cooking show. And so it was on TV because we could have it on TV. And the guy, was, the guy in the show was teaching us how to make, or teaching Pam, how to make risotto. And, if you've, and so if you've ever made risotto, one of the key things about risotto is you got to keep stirring it, right? If you stop stirring that risotto, there is no, no risotto for you. And so the guy was being funny. Like he was, you didn't know you're getting cooking advice when you came to church today. But the guy was hilarious because he's like, when you start stirring that risotto, you don't let anything stop you from stirring that risotto. Your kid gets hurt, I'm making risotto. Mama comes to the door, I'm making risotto. Uh, Your husband gets sick, I'm making risotto. Phone rings, I'm making risotto. Military invasion, I'm making risotto. And so he's like, he's hamming it up. He's just yelling, I'm making risotto. His point was, no matter what you're saying, you're making risotto. And if you stop making risotto, it's going to get burnt. And so to this day, Pam and I are joking around like, I'm making risotto. Um, so <coughs> your point is, I kind of picture Nehemiah in that situation. I'm building a wall here, people. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. He, he knew what mattered most in that moment. It was not this peace conference, which was a sham anyways. It was building the wall. He was not going to let anything get in his way. And that's a really good lesson for us. Because you may not be up on a wall, but I guarantee that there are, there are priorities God has for your life and for my life every single day. That it's so easy to get pulled to lesser things that may seem good, but are not God's best. Right? Like, 
there are times when we know, we know what God desires for us. We know what God wants for us. We know the, we know the mission God has for us as, as believers, as, as obedient followers of Christ, as gospel witnesses to our neighbors, as, as followers of Christ. We have priorities in our lives to, you know, for Christ, for his mission, for our faith, and for our souls. But it's so easy to get caught up in good things that we forget the best things. It's easy to get sucked away in secondary priorities and not focus on the real priorities of God. I mean, how many of us wake up in the morning, and even this morning, I got up silly early, like, like a little before 4 a.m. this morning, I was kind of woken up and then just, we're going for the day. And so here I am now, but, but I woke up at 4 a.m. and I, I just didn't want to go, I didn't want to get up, I didn't want to, like, it's 4 a.m., like who really wants to get up on, on a Sunday morning? Uh, but I had studying to do, I had things to do, but I found myself laying in bed, just scrolling on my phone, watching reels, checking news sites, like just literally doing nothing when I could have been up, you know, doing some sermon prep, more sermon, which I'd got, it was 4 a.m. I had plenty of time. But the point is, how many days do we, we know like we should spend time with God in the morning? We should spend some time in prayer in the morning, but yet we just get sucked into other stuff right away, whether it's work emails or games or whatever it might be. The priorities, the the good thing, not anything bad, but not God's best. Or how many of us know we're called to love our neighbors, serve our neighbors, share Christ with our neighbors, but just the busyness of life pulls us from that. Or how many churches we know are called to make disciples and and be be disciple-making people, but yet we get stuck with set up and tear down and this program or that program. It's so easy to to know the priorities that God has for us but then get pulled away to lesser things. And God has shown us in his word and through the example of Nehemiah that priorities help us avoid, knowing our priorities, sticking to our priorities, help us to avoid the trap of not following God at his best. It kind of reminds me a little bit of of what Jesus said in Mary and Martha. There's a story from the gospel of, of Luke where Jesus goes to the home of Mary and Martha. Let me read it for you a little bit here. But it it says this, when, when they were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Martha who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha, distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me alone? And so tell her to come give me a hand. And the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. You see, in that moment, there was a priority battle. Martha was busying herself with the tasks of hosting while while Martha was busy with the task of hosting while Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And in that moment, the one necessary thing was Jesus, not the, not the cooking, not the cleaning, not the whatever. And so for our lives, here's, here's why I bring that story up. There is a real danger of busying ourselves with good things while missing God's best things. There's a real danger in getting our priorities out of alignment so that we get so sucked up with kind of secondary, even good things that we miss out the great things and the best things that God has for us each day, the mission things that God has for us. And so Nehemiah is an example here because when he's called to this peace conference, which sounds like a good thing, he tells them, I'm doing the God thing, which is making this wall. Why should I stop the important work when I have this good thing to do? And so each day, let's ask ourselves, what's, what's the priority that God wants us to face What's the priority that God wants us to pursue? And let's go after it hard. And let's not let secondary things pull us away. So the, trap, the first trap that Nehemiah avoids, which faces every single one of us, is the trap of missing the priorities. The second trap, though, is the trap of unnecessary conflict. The trap of unnecessary conflict kind of stirred up by gossip. So verse, verse 5 continues. After Nehemiah told them no four times, they continue. Verse 5, Sambalat sent me the same message a fifth time by his aide 
who had an open letter in hand. And in it, it was written, it is reported among the nations. I'm going to read it like I think they read it. It is reported among the nations that Geshem, and Geshem agrees that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf. There is a king in Judah, and these rumors will be heard by the king. So, let's confer together. Right? Like, they are, they are just straight gossiping now, stirring rumors trying to pull Nehemiah into conflict. And that's the whole reason why this is an open letter. The whole reason why this is an open letter is because they want everybody along the way to take a peek at this later letter. They want all the people to go, oh my goodness, really? Oh my goodness, no. Oh no, oh no. Don't, don't spread this rumor. Like they want, they want to pull Nehemiah into crisis to stop the mission of God. And the truth is, gossip and rumors are really good at stopping the mission of God. Notice how Nehemiah responds. Verse 8. Then I replied to him, There is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them in your own mind. For they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. I love the three things Nehemiah does. He denies it, clearly. He defines reality. Hey, and then he prays. Like, he denies it, saying, it's not true. Like, we don't even need to discuss this. Like, the king knows it. My people know it. What you're saying is total lies. And then he, he tells them, it's all made up in your brains. You've, you've made up this yourselves. But then he knows how dangerous this can be. He knows how dangerous gossip can be. So he prays there at the end, God, strengthen my hands. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. Even though Nehemiah refuses to play this conflict game, he still prays to God because he needs help in this. And the truth is, when you say that little kid's phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, the truth is words can do damage. Gossip can do damage. Rumors can spread and cause damage. And so while Nehemiah refuses to get himself sucked into the conflict, he does know that there is danger here. And so he turns and appeals to God for God's help, for God's hand. And so while in our lives today, as we think about the power of words, the power of conflict, the power of gossip, think how much this sort of stuff pulls you from God's mission, pulls you from God's purposes? How hard is it to pray and read your Bible when there's conflict stirring in your home or in your family or in your community? Like it's it's hard sometimes to read your Bible when you're just so angry or when you're so worried or there's, there's this stirring conflict happening around you. It can pull your mind, it can pull your passion from God's work. I've been in churches before where there's been conflict. Never here, of course. Never our church. But, but I've been in places before where, where there's conflict. And it's really hard to say, let's go engage our neighbors when we're so busy fighting each other. It's really hard to get passionate about coming to worship when you know that this person's going to be there and they said this about you. Or when this person's going to be there and they thought this and, and spread this rumor. So the truth is, words and gossip and conflict can suck us from the mission. We have to refuse to play the game, but we have to realize how dangerous it can be. We must refuse to find ourselves pulled into the conflict, because that's not the answer. But we have to realize the potency and the danger of words. And, and the thing is about accusations and gossip, the history of the church is filled with people making false accusations about Christ and Christians. Like, this is not something that Nehemiah has only faced. Like, they called Nehemiah names. They said, you want to be king? You want to rebel? They fabricated this whole story about why Nehemiah was building the wall. But the truth is, that has happened throughout all of Christianity. False accusation, false rumors, false gossip has followed the message of Christ throughout all these centuries into today. I mean, Jesus himself, the Pharisees, the rulers, They accused Jesus of blasphemy. Do you think Jesus really blasphemed God? 
I don't think so. He is God. Like, everything he said was true. But they accused Jesus of being a blasphemer. They accused Jesus of wanting to rebel against Rome. They accused Jesus of being a lawbreaker. They accused Jesus of wanting to eliminate the wall. They accused Jesus of being a heretic, of being a distraction, a dissenter. So all these titles they threw at Jesus. He answered them with the truth of God's word. 60 years later or 30 years later after Jesus, in 60 AD, Christianity had kind of spread throughout Rome and it was a, it was a wildfire of growth and the, the gospel was going forth. And there was this, in 60 AD under Nero, there was this massive fire in Rome. And they had to blame somebody. So you know who they blamed? Christians. It's because those Christians, this, this illegal religion, it must, be, it must be the Christians' fault that we had this terrible, destructive fire. It can't be because, you know, somebody forgot to close the door when they were smoking in the back. It has to be something that the divine, sovereign hands are against us. And so, so they, they blamed Christians to the point where they rounded Christians up. Would, would make them fight against lions in the Colosseum. They would, they, would bear, we would, they would drip them in oil and light them on fire. Like they blamed Christians for this destruction. They called Christians cannibalism, cannibalists. Want to know why? The Lord's Supper. When Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When you're, you know, this, you're eating, the, eating the communion, we, it's a picture, we believe, of Jesus Christ. Well, the, the Romans looked on and go, that's weird. Why are you eating your, why are you eating your like, Savior? That's strange. You're cannibalists. So the point is, all throughout history, false accusations against Christians have been thrown and thrown and thrown. Today, Christians are th- having accusations and gossip thrown at them too. You guys are haters, right? I mean, how many, like, we don't have to go through all the names, but the truth is you're hypocrites, judgmental, right-wing, fundamentalist, conspiracy theory. Um, you are bigots. You hate women. You, like, all this sort of, like, you can go, you can go across the board and names have been thrown at Christians. And we know from God's word, those are just not true. Our choice is, do we get sucked into the conflict or are we just to continue to do the work that God has called us to do? With Nehemiah, he says, it's not true. You're making stuff up, but God strengthened my hand. How's that for a good response? It's not true. Here's what God's word says. But God, we need your help in this. And that's where, that's where I think our hearts ought to be. If you want to avoid the trap of unnecessary conflict, don't get sucked into every battle don't, don't over-worry every rumor. Don't, don't feel like you got to engage with every gossip. But ask God for help. Ask God for wisdom and move forward on this mission. Now, here's the third one, which I think is actually one of the more interesting ones. The third trap here is the trap of failed integrity. And this one, I, I want to camp here for a little bit. Um, we'll finish up the fourth one pretty quickly. But what happened was is they, they, didn't, they couldn't get Nehemiah to, to do peace with them because of his priorities. They couldn't get Nehemiah to engage in their gossip because he just corrected them. But now they try to personally get Nehemiah to fall in his integrity and his leadership. They actually go after his character and, and his integrity. So look, look how this story works out in verse 10. Uh, I flipped my page too early. Verse 10. I went to the house of Shemaniah, or Shemaiah, 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 son of Deliah, son of Matabiel, who was restricted to his house. And he said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the doors because they are coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. So apparently there's this prophet in, in Jerusalem And he calls Nehemiah to him and he said, hey, Nehemiah, let's quickly run over to the temple. Let's shut the door. Let's hide. Your enemies are coming to kill you. Sambalat, Tobiah, they're they're on their way right now. They've hired an assassin. They're they're coming to take you out. I mean, this is movie plot kind of stuff going on here. And so this this prophet of God says, I have a vision and you're going to, they're coming to get you tonight. Let's go run and hide in the temple. There's a problem with that. First and foremost, Nehemiah is not a priest. Nehemiah is not allowed in the temple 
because that's outside of his call. Only priests are allowed in the temple. So for Nehemiah to go to the temple, that would be sin. For Nehemiah to run to the temple, that would be also a lack of courage in his leadership. And so, so there's something fishy going on here. And look at verse 11 as it continues. But I said, Nehemiah said, should a man like me run away? And how could someone like me enter the temple and live? I will not go. See, Nehemiah knows the word of God. He knows what's important to leadership. He goes, a man like me, I, I need to show courage. And a man like me is not allowed in the temple. You know, several, several uh, decades ago, centuries ago at that point, a guy named uh, King, King Uzziah, he, um, he went into the temple without permission. And he broke out in leprosy because God takes his temple seriously. And he, he told his kings, like, there's, there's divisions of prophet, priest, and king, and you don't cross those lines. Nehemiah knows he's not a priest. He's kind of ruling right now in this kind of kingly role. He's not a priest. He's not allowed in the temple. So he's like, I'm not going to sin against God by running to your temple. So verse 12 shows you this. Verse 12, it says, I realized that God had not sent him, because of the prophecy he spoke against me that Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated and, so that, and do as he suggested, sin and get a bad reputation in order that he could discredit me. So they, this, is, this is how nasty it's getting. Sambalat and Tobiah hire a, by a prophet of God, and I use that word quotation mark now, like, People, God's prophets can't be hired or shouldn't be able to be hired. But they hire this guy to have a false prophecy to try to get Nehemiah to sin. And Nehemiah sees right through it because this is not following the word of God. But the trap here is a clear trap. It's an attack on integrity. It's an attack on character. It's an attack on what's right. And the truth is, we may not be in the same situation as Nehemiah. There's no temple. There's no false prophet. But every single day, your character and your integrity, my character and my integrity, has moments of attack and vulnerability, just like Nehemiah. Every time we, I mean, how often do you see church leaders and Christian leaders who have their character comes under attack and they fall under that or their integrity is, is li it limits what God is. They, they fall or they have to walk away because of just failure in their lives. Our characters are constantly under attack. Our integrity is constantly being tested. And so Nehemiah refuses to put himself in a place where he is, where a situation where his character is attacked and his integrity can be questioned. And so he refuses to fall into the integrity trap. He's committed to following after God. And the truth is the same for us, that our character matters, our integrity matters, and every single day, we don't want to put ourselves in compromising positions. We don't want to put ourselves in situations where our character is under questions. And this attacks us from every single direction. Every time we turn on our phones, there's temptations to be pulled away in our character integrity. Every time we have a conversation with our neighbors, there's a chance to have our integrity pulled away. Sometimes we find ourselves in moments where, where our souls are just not guarded the way they should be or not protected the way they should be. And so there are all these moments where our integrity and our character is vulnerable. And Nehemiah shows us that he refuses, even at the safety of his life. He says, I would rather face the risk of death than the consequences of sinning against God. How is that for bold leadership? I would rather wait out this, this so-called assassin in holiness than run in sin to safety, supposed safety. Now, I think, I think you and I, we need to take our souls seriously. We need to take our integrity seriously. But I want you to, I want to remember, I want you to remind ourselves of something. The beautiful news about the gospel is that your integrity, your righteousness, your holiness is, is not built on your work, but it's on Jesus' work. 
It's the difference between what Nehemiah does here and what we do in our lives today. We know that Nehemiah could not live with perfect integrity, that Nehemiah was a sinner just like you and I are sinners, that, that Nehemiah has done things outside of God's plan. He's had moments of character failing. He had moments of character weakness. We don't, they're not recorded in this book, but there are moments where he is a sinner just like you and I are sinners. And so through the lens of the New Testament, what we know is that our integrity and our character is not built on our works and our efforts, but it's worked on the gospel. It's built on what Jesus Christ has done. So perfection is not the goal here. It's Christ's righteousness and the pursuit of Jesus that's the goal. And from that place, from the righteousness we have from Christ, and from the holiness we have from Christ, and from the pursuit of Jesus Christ, then we seek the character that God wants us to have, the integrity that God has. But it's not, I need to pursue my character so Jesus will love me. It's, Jesus has loved me, has saved me, and has freed me so I can pursue my character and integrity. Make sure we get that right, or it's a really messy way to live and diminishes the power of the gospel. You see, the pursuit of character and integrity must not come from some kind of legalistic drive or legalistic hope that under your efforts, you're going to secure God's love. But instead, our relationship in Jesus frees us to pursue Christ, to pursue holiness, to pursue righteousness but we want to guard our souls. We want to take that seriously. And I think from Nehemiah, we see a couple ways that we can do that. Number one, Nehemiah knows the Bible. He knows when a trap's laid before him. He knows when the prophet was lying because the prophet was calling him to go into sin, to do things that were contrary to God's word. So if you and I want to protect our integrity, if we want to avoid the integrity trap, we have to know the Bible. We have to know what's right and what's wrong. We have to be able to pursue that because from the truth of God's word, we know when to say yes and when to say no, when to avoid and when to press in, what to do, what not to do. We have to understand what God desires. So if you want to protect your integrity and character, the first thing we need to do is, is know God's plan for our lives. But then we also, I believe, I think we need to avoid compromising situations. If you want to, if you want to walk as Nehemiah walked and protect your integrity, protect your character, we need to avoid compromising situations. And what I mean by that is just we, need to, we know that there are situations we can find ourselves in that would, that would lead us to bad decisions questionable decisions, character decisions, and we can build in prevent, preventing things to not allow that to happen. I mean, I can give you lots of practical examples. And so like, you know, when we, I talked a few weeks ago about one of, my, one of my good friends and mentors in ministry had some sort of, we don't know all the details, but he had some sort of extramarital affair. I mean, I guess that's all affairs, but he had, he had some sort of marital indiscretion um, that's all I know, and that's all I need to know. But something happened where he found himself cheating on his wife and, and disqualifying himself from ministry. And so what that's, you know, it's forced all of us pastors to go, I don't want to ever be in a situation like that. So there's certain things I will not do, certain meetings I will not have, certain places I will not go because it's just not worth it. And so you avoid those compromising situations. If you come to our house, we have filters on our computers and on our phones because we don't want compromising situations. If you, you know, when it, when it comes to Pam and I, Pam knows everything about me. She knows my passwords. She, I, I'm low jacked with my phone's GPS. Like she knows, hey, you've been at the gym a little long. What's going on? Like it's not weird. It's, it's a way of keeping accountability. Um, we have people that do finances. So whatever it is, whatever your life looks like, Find ways to build buffers so that way you avoid compromising situations. Nehemiah refuses to go where he will be compromised. Live with discernment. In fact, I love that because he's like, I would rather die than compromise myself. That's, that's powerful. Live with discernment is another thing I would say is be wise. Like be, be trusting, be honest, but be wise. Be accountable. And also keep, keep the big picture in mind. Nehemiah knew that he had favor with God, that God was blessing his work, that God was working in his work, and Nehemiah knew that was the most important thing in his life right then. And the truth is your character and my character, while we are built on the righteousness of Christ, we don't want anything to compromise our mission and our effectiveness for him. So keep pressing forward under, the, under our integrity and character through the righteousness we have from Christ. 
Now let me finish this up. Verse, uh, notice what happens here. As Nehemiah avoids this trap, verse 15, it says this, The wall was completed in 52 days on the 25th day of the month of Elul. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. You want to have a good flex on your enemies? Finish the job. You want, to, you want to shut down your opponents and answer your opposition? Finish the job. When people tell you your faith isn't real, show them through your hope. When people tell you you can't start that ministry, do this mission, lead this way, read the Bible, have a quiet time. When people tell you you can't do something, when you're following God's plan, finish the job by God's strength and show them. Nehemiah flexes on his enemies by in 52 days. That seems impossible. But in 50, we can't even get like a pothole fixed around here in 52 days. But Nehemiah fixes the entire walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. He goes forward with that. Now, I really don't have time for this last one, but let me just, let me just walk this through real fast. The last trap is the trap of wrong influences or leadership. I'll just read the verses and give you one idea. During those days, verse 17 During those days, the nobles of Judah sent letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them, for many in Judah were bound by oath to him. In other words, he had them in their pocket. Um, Since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, the Arab, and his son son was Jehonanan, and was married to the daughter of Meshulam and son of Barakchia, these nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him, And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So Tobiah is still around. The wall is done, but Tobiah is still influencing. He's still trying to get then. And so all the people in Jerusalem are going, hey, you know, Tobiah, he's actually kind of a nice guy. I know he tried to kill you. I know he tried to like shut down the work. I know he's rallied troops. I know he called you a wimp. I know he tried to get you to sin, but like he's just tragically misunderstood. Like he's a, he's really not a bad guy. You should... You should let him influence your life too. You should, you should give him a seat at the table. Like That'll make him happy. They're, they're trying to get Tobiah to influence and lead. Here's what Nehemiah does in verse, verse chapter 7. When the wall had been rebuilt and I had doors installed, the gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed. And then I put my brother Hananiah in charge of Jerusalem, along with Hananiah, commander of the fortress, because... He was a faithful man who feared God more than most. So when all this stirring about Tobiah being a good guy, Nehemiah turns around and he says, my brother's going to be in charge of the city, the gates, and the fortress. Want to know why? Because he fears God more than most. One of the traps that we can fall into is, is having the wrong influences. I guarantee there are Tobias in your life trying to lead you one way, when you need a guy that fears God more than most. And so ask yourself, who is leading your life? Who is influencing your life? And who are you following? Those four traps are before us every single day. The trap of priority, the trap of conflict, the trap of integrity, and the trap of leadership. And if we can look out for those four things, I know that they will, they will help us to full force run after God's mission, and I want that for my life as well. The good news is God is faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13 reminds us that he will not let us be tempted more than we are able, but with temptation provides a way out. So all these traps, there is a way out. God is faithful as we have sung about. In Christ, we are forgiven and we have his righteousness. We are free to pursue him. Let me close this in prayer as we end.